The deep woods can hold all kinds of monsters, mysteries, and unexplainable events. And, personally, these are my favorite stories to share on the channel. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Now, before we jump into these stories, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode, and get ready for these creepy and allegedly true Deep Woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. I have seen the dog man by Riri. Hello, Swamp Dweller. My name is Ree. I want to tell you about my story that I believe is my encounter with the Dogman. I've encountered this creature at least three times. I first saw the Dogman sometime around 3 a.m. down Paradise Road in Pineville, Louisiana. I was going to a friend's house when I noticed this big dog run in the middle of the road. So I slammed on my brakes and waited for it to cross, but this dog stopped in the middle of the road, stood up on its hind legs like a human, and ran into the woods after, after some time. I, I began to drive again, but I immediately turned around and went home. I was in shock. Now, the second time I saw this creature was a little after 3am again, and I was riding my friend's crotch rocket. I stopped because I thought someone was standing in the middle of the road, until I raised the shield to see it wasn't someone, it was something. And when I hit my brights, the creature got on all fours and ran into the woods. I turned around once again and went back to my friend's house absolutely bewildered. The third time I saw the dog man was in Essler Field. On my way home, I noticed something running in front of the car. I slammed on my brakes hoping I wasn't going to hit whatever it was, but when I opened my eyes, this massive dog, werewolf, I don't even know how to explain it creature, was looking at me through the windshield. I was so scared, I honestly thought this thing was about to break through and kill me. After staring at me for about five or so seconds, this thing took off, walking like a human until it got to the tree line. Then, once again, it got on all fours and disappeared into the woods, never to be seen again. I was so scared, I hurried home, hoping this thing wasn't chasing me. When I got home, I got out of the car. When I got on the porch, I heard this ear-piercing howl. And this, my friends, was the last time I think I saw the dog man. Something made me feel hunted. By Anonymous. I was walking from my boyfriend's house after midnight last night. I've known him for six years, so I've been there all the time and have never felt anything like this. The woods surrounding this estate on side to side make this walk home feel eerie at night. There are only a few houses that are sprinkled here and there. My path to my house overlooks a hill and the woods that are behind me. The entire walk takes maybe about five minutes on a good day. As I was walking, I was fumbling through my pockets to find my AirPods when a sudden dread overwhelmed me. This came out of nowhere and surprised me, but I was suddenly paralyzed with fear. I contemplated calling him to go and get me, but I couldn't force myself. I don't know what I thought would happen, but I could feel tears come and I started running. As I approached a clearance, I assumed the air was thick and quiet and everything felt off. I've been walking this same path for six years and I've never felt like this before. To clarify, we live in Ireland, in a relatively safe area. There are usually no large animals or predators in this area. I'm unsure if this belongs here, but I would love to know your thoughts. I still feel super uneasy and uncomfortable about this. In hindsight, walking at night with AirPods is a very stupid idea. I was lulled into a sense of false security living in a relatively safe area 
in a neighborhood where rarely anything ever happens. I should also probably add that I'm an immigrant, and despite living in Ireland for almost a decade, I don't know anything about fairies, and I've seen many people mention in the past, when I've told them this story, that this could be something to do with fairies. In any case, I'm glad nothing wrong happened, but this shook me enough that I'm going to be a lot more careful when I'm walking alone. I stumbled upon something weird. By... Anonymous. This happened a while ago but stuck with me, so I wanted to share it. I was at a friend's house for a weekend with many of my friends and we all went for a walk. She lives right at the edge of the countryside where there are fields, woods, and whatnot. So we went down this forest path. This other guy and I started exploring a bit deeper into the trees and we had gone quite a far ways down into the hills into the thicker trees. But there was a clearing just beyond that. A big log was lying on the ground, and resting on it was a skinned deer. There were no bones or anything, just the skin and the head and antlers. It was... it was strange. The head was on the log, the eyes were missing, and the skin was wrapped down and draped around it. Beside it was a crucifix made out of really rotten planks. It was all tied up with a bale string. This guy and I freaked out, and I called out to our other friends to come check it out, but he told me not to show them because they'd find it too disturbing. He shook it off and started climbing back up, but I stared at it for ages. He waited for me for so long that he told me to walk away from it after some time. A string attached to the crucifix ran further into the woods, but following it wouldn't be normal for me, so I just went back. I still can't comprehend what it was. Some kind of pagan ritual? Some kind of cult? Maybe some sort of prank? Not many people walk this forest path besides locals walking their dogs, and we had come pretty far off path. My friend also said that people didn't hunt these woods because that was not permitted here. So I didn't really push it with the questioning since I didn't really want to go too far deep into it while I was already out there. Now while I come to the realization I probably don't want to know what was out there in the woods behind my house, I find the lack of answers has me thinking about it more and more. I guess if I would have died out there or whatever, I wouldn't have to live with this. But I do believe like it was the beginning of a horror movie where all my friends and I would be killed off one by one by some sort of forest witch or supernatural monster. Maybe it's some sort of bad omen or something like that. If anybody has any idea, let me know. I'd love to have some more clarity. Shot at in Yosemite by Cali Coast. My friend was on a solo backpacking trip through Yosemite National Park. He started talking to a guy he met on this trail about his trip. The guy said he often did solo trips as well, but would never solo again after experiencing something horrific on his last journey. The guy said he was two days into a six-day hike in the middle of the desolate wilderness when he came upon a dead man in a suit with a bullet hole in his head, and the body was very fresh. He never heard any gunshots, and he could see no sign of anyone else around. He was filled with dread and felt like he was being watched at all directions. He took off running back down the trail in the direction from where he came from. He hiked back to the trailhead for about two days and two nights without rest. He said the nighttime was absolutely the worst. Every little noise he heard and the shadows he saw felt like somebody or something was stalking him through the dark. Eventually, upon his return, he told authorities about it but never heard back from them. He wondered if maybe the man was shot and thrown from a helicopter. My friend said he had to stay with a group for a few nights after hearing that story and even cut his trip short, feeling pretty spooked himself out there in the wilderness. So, suffice to say, all in all from this short, small, little scary tale, be safe out there and trust no one but yourself.
Strange Encounters on the PCT by Lucid Friends This past year I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. There were about 600 miles of trail I hiked and camped all by myself. One of the sections I was alone on was in Northern California, slightly north of Shasta. I got to a beautiful spot and knew it was the best spot to set up my camp. It was absolutely gorgeous and had 360 views of everywhere around me. I could see the views of the woods in the valley below and the mountains everywhere. I could see it raining on Mount Shasta. It's my favorite campsite in NorCal. I still remember the exact mile marker and have some sight footage during daylight and nightlight hours. I stood up my tent and after admiring the sunset, I went to bed. I could see outside below the vestibule when I was lying down in my tent. As I tried to sleep, I noticed a white light in the valley, maybe about a quarter to a half mile away, not near my tent or anything. I wasn't close to any towns. I would see an occasional remote cabin in the woods in Sierra Nevadas, but nothing too much. So I figured it was probably that. But there needed to be an access point or dirt roads or something. There were no forest clearings, just thick woods surrounded by mountains. I looked at the light briefly and tried to think of what it could have been. But this was a pretty remote place, so I really couldn't think of anything. I was tired from hiking all day and didn't think much of it, if I'm honest. A little while later, I looked at again and noticed another light. It was an orange light slowly circling the white light. It was gradually morphing in shape as it circled. I watched it for quite some time, trying to understand what I was looking at. It had a very calm motion, and it was almost mesmerizing. It wasn't like many people's UFO or orb experiences where it darts around and then vanishes. I eventually fell asleep. It started raining around midnight, and I looked out my tent and still saw both lights. One white stationary light and one orange morphing light. I woke up again sometime around 4am to use the bathroom. I walked outside my tent, and it was still there, using the same motion. I tried to get a video, but due to the distance and darkness, it looked like another shitty video that didn't show anything. I woke up around sunrise and looked for it, but neither light was there. I didn't see these lights at around sunset or sunrise, only darkness. I know these would have been visible during the sunset and sunrise too if they were still there. I'm racking my brain, but I'm sure there has to be an explanation, but I genuinely have no clue as to what it was that I saw and I'm still trying to figure it out. A typical dog walk turns out to be not so typical. By Anonymous. Hi Swamp Dweller, I don't know if you'd be interested in a story from England. It's kind of long-winded and not necessarily the most terrifying thing. But it's a weird and scary experience that me and my partner will never forget. To set the scene, we live in a busy city in the South Midlands of England. We have a bully breed dog and take him out for walks in the surrounding parks and woods quite often. I'm quite into the paranormal and have experienced lots of things. My mom is a spiritual medium, so I guess it comes with the territory. My partner, however, is a science graduate and is a very everything-has-an-explanation sort of person. Anyway, on this day, we decided to go to a popular picnic park just on the outskirts of the city. It's almost always full of families, dog walkers, and picnickers. It was late spring, and the temperature was just starting to hit summer heat. It was a sunny day, not a cloud in the sky, and no wind. The park was full of the usual parents and kids with their families and dogs, old couples going for walks and the like. Here in England, bully breeds are still quite stigmatized and feared, so we usually avoid going where there are lots of people. Not that our dog is dangerous or anything, he's just overly friendly, and people freak out when he trots up to greet them. So we decided to go off the beaten track. To give you a rough idea, 
The park has a small lake in the center, with paths and benches that surround it. Just off one of those paths are a few farmer's fields in a thick wooded area which snakes around into another path which eventually leads back to the park. We decided to go through the cattle gate, which leads up through the farmer's fields. It was so hot and beautiful that day that nothing spooky or creepy even crossed our minds. Even though you could no longer see anyone, you could still hear kids playing and dogs barking in the distance. As we came up to the wooded area, whilst still on the dirt path alongside it, I noticed a man walking through the thick brush. I thought it was weird, because he was coming from the opposite end of the woods which literally leads to nothing. No houses or roads or anything of the likes. Just endless fields and woods. I just told myself, oh, he must be looking for his dog or something. My partner noticed him too, and we shared a look to each other like, what a weirdo, and carried on walking. But I couldn't help but look at him. He looked so strange. It must have been close to 30 degrees, and he was in a thick black hoodie, black trousers, or sweats. He had longish, dirty blonde hair, and maybe around our age, so mid-twenties. But what was more strange is he had a dazed sort of smile on his face and his head kind of tilted to one side. When he walked, he swayed from side to side slightly. I tried to push it to the back of my mind, telling myself that he was just a stoner or something looking for his dog. He wasn't calling or making noises to get a dog's attention or anything, which was even more strange to me. Anyway, I kept looking back over my shoulder. He was in the brush for a little while longer but then joined the path we were on and began walking our way. He must have been about 30 feet behind us. I noticed how tall he was now that we were on the same path and how broad he was. He must have been about 6 foot 9, closer to 7. He was huge maybe 17 or 18 stone, so something like 240 to 250 pounds more or less. Around this point, we noticed everything was silent. There were no kids laughing, no indistinctive family chatter, no dogs barking, no birds tweeting, nothing. The only sound that I could discern was the sound of our footsteps in the wind. But there was no wind. It was roasting hot, not even a slight breeze yet. We could hear wind blowing through the trees. Even though the sun was beating down, it felt darker somehow. Like everything was, I don't know, desaturated. My partner started to freak out, and strangely, so did our dog. Now this really struck me as weird. Our boy's the kind of dog who would greet anyone, run up to them to play. But no, he wouldn't even look back at me or the man. My partner and dog started to speed up to get away from the wooded area this weird behemoth of a man was in. I really started to freak out myself, but don't want to upset my partner even further, so I kept my cool, quiet, and kept my pace. I looked over my shoulder again and he was closer, maybe 25 feet away. Now for a bit of context, as you exit the wooded area you come to a path which is surrounded on either side with tall thick bushes, and it curves around widely to lead you back to the main park. The curve is so wide that you can see far ahead, but you can only see the bushes where it curves. Neither of the exits are in view. As we reach this path, I check again, and the guy is closer still. It's still silent. All I can hear is the faint wind sounds in our footsteps, but nothing from the man. He's smiling still in that dazed sort of way, and still is kind of swaying. Everything still felt weird and dull, and that's the only way I can describe it. I thought to myself, if this weird bloke is going to try something, I'm going to have to protect my partner. I'm only 5'8 myself, and not much of a fighter. So I grabbed my car keys and put them between my fingers in my pocket. If this dude wanted to try anything, I'd smash him in the face and leg it. I'm not fast either, but I convinced myself I'd be faster than him. I check over my shoulder again, and he is still close. I start to hype myself up. He was coming and I was ready. I realized I couldn't hear him at all though. He was probably about 15 feet behind me now. My partner and dog had literally hightailed it up the path, but why couldn't I hear any footsteps from him? Another quick glance and he was right behind me, five feet or so. This was it. If I was going to do anything, it had to be now. If I could keep the element of surprise on my side, I might be able to stand a chance and give us the opportunity to run. I swung around as quick as I could, 
and went to shout out at him and swipe at him, but he was gone. There was nothing there, no man or no sign of him whatsoever. I paused and looked around. He couldn't have run back along the path. He couldn't be that quick. I would still be able to see him as the path winds around so widely he would still be in view. He couldn't have jumped through either side of the path into the rows of bushes as I would have heard it and seen the rustling of the bushes or the hole he would have made. He had simply vanished. I stayed there for a moment and only when I decided to walk on to check on my other half and the dog that I realized I could hear the park again. The wind noises had gone and the day returned to normal. The sunlight was no longer dull and everything seemed normal. I got shivers and ran to catch up. I asked my partner if they had seen him go anywhere but they didn't see anything. They just said he really freaked them out and they didn't want to be there anymore. I could see that they were really shaken up. The dog was back to normal though, wagging his tail and wanting to play and explore. We decided to cut our walk short and drive home. After we got home, I rang my mom and told her all about it. She advised me to check reports for missing people or deaths related to that area, which I did and weirdly enough, lots of people have died there by suicide or overdoses, but none of the people I found online matched this description. I tried to forget about it and get back to normal life and all that. I was applying to go back to college at the time, so I didn't really need to be thinking about giant ghost men. After a few days, it had left our minds and we got back to normality. A few nights later, I wake up in the middle of the night and open my eyes. As they adjust to our darkness, I look up at the ceiling where the orange glow of the street lamp shines through our window, and my heart stops. He was there, stood over our bed. He was so tall with his head just below the ceiling light. He still had that weird dazed smile all lit up with the orange glow. I jump up and punch at him as hard as I can, but my fist doesn't meet anything, because there was nothing there. I turned on the light and looked around, found nothing. I absolutely ransacked the house and found not a single person. I've never seen him since, but after seeing him in our bedroom, our apartment felt horrid afterwards. It never felt homey or safe again, and we would hear horrible things. For example, at one point in the middle of the night, I heard my own voice call my partner's name from the other side of our bedroom. We heard walking in our attic, which was too low for people to walk in, and our pets would not sleep alone. They would always growl at corners of the house. We left that flat after a year or so of dealing with the weird ghostly experiences. My partner, of course, kept denying that it was a ghost. She just said that it couldn't be explained. My Weird Stories While Being a Logger by Anonymous The logging company I work for is tasked with clearing a large land for a housing development. While walking the ground, I spot several hickory trees grouped together. I note the location as I plan on taking them for myself over the weekend while everyone else is at home resting for the previous work week. Some barbecue places in my area will pay good money for a load of hickory. That Saturday, I load my chainsaws and busting mauls in the bed of my truck and head toward the job site. At the entrance, a group of people gathers, protesting the clearing of the land. Save the animals natural habitat or something. Save the animals natural habitat or something like that. Those animals don't help me pay the bills. And until they do, I'm clearing it out. The protesters block the entrance. I slowly pull up, roll down my window, and politely ask them to move. The protesters stand firm. I push down on the gas pedal for a moment, giving one of them a bump with the front of my truck. I continued to do this until they finally decided to move out of my way. I creep into the entrance, continuing to push protesters aside with my truck. The last protester screamed in my window. These trees give us oxygen and provide habitat for thousands of animals. Screw the animals, I said as I spit in her face, quickly driving away before any retaliation could take place. It doesn't take long to find the hickories as I remember their exact location. Ten hickories in all. It's hard work cutting them, busting them up into manageable pieces, loading the truck down, and making several trips from barbecue restaurants to this location. I dread dealing with the rude protesters every trip, but the extra money would be worth it. 
I downed the first three trees no problem. This old saw I had restored was cutting through the wood like butter. I was ready to lay down the fourth hickory when I got distracted by movement in my peripheral vision. During this distraction, the saw kicks back, almost tearing into my leg. I drop the saw. I look down to see a rip in my jeans where I saw the blade caught it. That was too close. I say aloud, my heart racing from the close call. I spin around, ready to scream out profanities and belittle the little jackass protester that distracted me and almost led to the destruction of my leg. To my surprise, no protester was in sight, only a giant buck. Its rack was huge, 14 pointer at least. I'm an avid hunter and I don't think I've ever even seen one this big. If only I had my rifle handy. I'd have a nice head to mount on my wall, and some nice meat for the freezer. Then something unexpected happened. The buck's eyes started to glow red. I investigate them, almost hypnotized by the red glow. I was in such a trance, I didn't hear the snap and pop of the now falling tree behind me. The tree glanced off my shoulder and into the side of my knee, collapsing me to the ground. The massive tree was still on top of my leg, pinning me to the ground. I let out a scream that I thought for sure one of the protesters would be able to hear. But after laying on the ground for several minutes in pure agony, it became clear they had not heard me. I began to assess the damage. My jeans were beginning to turn red from the blood. I stick my fingers into the rip previously caused by the chainsaw and rip the jeans. I continue to tear away at the fabric until only the seam connects the lower part of my jeans to the upper part. I roll the jeans up as tightly as possible, the flesh tender to the touch. I get the jeans just above the knee, and I can now see the bone protruding from my skin just below the knee. I get a slightly light head and must turn my head away, the sight of blood and bone sending a sickening feeling through my stomach. I must try hard not to vomit or pass out. I try yelling again. I scream until my voice is hoarse, but no one can seemingly hear me. No one is coming. I can't lay here for two more days, pinned under this tree, waiting for my friends and co-workers to come. I must do something. I plant my free foot on the massive hickory and began to push. The tree trunk starts to rock back and forth with each thrust of my leg. I try this repeatedly for what feels like hours, but I don't have the strength to push it off. I finally give up out of exhaustion. Days turn to night, and I begin to give up hope. I lay on my back staring up at the stars. This would be peaceful if not for the throbbing pain in my lower leg. Finally I pass out. I'm not sure if it was from exhaustion or blood loss, but I welcomed it. I woke up to a sharp pain shooting up my leg. I sit up to find myself surrounded by a pack of coyotes, one nod at my exposed bone while another lapped up fresh blood now pouring from my wound. Nipping at my crusted over scabs like I had not eaten in months, a pop sends a shockwave of pain through me as one of the coyotes sinks its teeth through my hard exterior of my bone. A swift kick to the head of one of them sent a few of them in retreat, but they continued to hover around licking the blood from the fur around their mouths, waiting for me to slip back into unconsciousness so they could finish their meal. Not none, assholes. I'm not giving up that easy. The rest of the night was spent trying to roll the massive tree off my leg until I gave out. I would rest for a while and try again, all while keeping the coyotes at bay. Just before sunlight, I heard massive footsteps in the distance that sent the coyotes into a panic to run as they disappeared into the forest. Help. Please help. I try to yell, trying to get the attention of whatever was causing the footsteps. That's when the buck from before appears from behind the trees and walks directly up to me. The buck is standing over me, peering down at me with those glaring red eyes. You did this to me, didn't you? The buck lets out a snort in response to my question. What's next? The buck turned its eyes to the sky as five vultures circled. I'm sorry, I don't want to die. Tears are streaming down my cheeks. I'll quit the logging business. 
I'll never cut down another tree if I live. Please help me. The buck tilts its head to the side as if it was contemplating whether I should live or die. It lets out another grunt. His eyes, red, begin to glow brighter. My light begins to fade as darkness overtakes me. I wake up several days later in the hospital. Part of me hoping that it was only a nightmare, but the notion is ripped away at my absence of my leg, amputated from the knee down. After recovering, I went home and sold my chainsaws, busting mauls, axes. I even sold my wood-burning grill and got charcoal. I'm not sure where the local barbecue restaurants will get their wood now, but it sure as hell won't be from me. The crew unloaded the last piece of equipment and prepared to clear out the 100 acres of timber. My boss, Larry, has been trying to buy this land for years from an old lady that refused to sell. Over the years, the two began to be very hateful towards each other. I went in with him on many attempts to talk to this lady about selling the land. She politely told Larry to leave. When he refused and continued pitching his proposal, she disappeared into her house. Larry paced in front of the door a few times, visibly aggravated at her disappearance and the fact that she wouldn't hear him out. A few moments later, she came back to the door with a broom in hand. Leave, or I'll hit you. Ma'am, we both know you're not going to hit me. Please hear me out. A loud thump grabs my attention as I look up to see the business end of the broom go across Larry's head. He blocks the second shot with his forearm before fleeing off the porch and back to his truck. A few months go by. The old lady, I found out her name was Grace, passed away. Someone broke into her house and put a knife to her throat. The police described a brutal scene of furniture overturned, blood-soaked carpet, and the lifeless eyes of Grace staring back at them. The knife had cut so deep that it almost decapitated the poor woman. After months of investigation, the case went cold with very little evidence being left behind from the killer. The bank took possession of her land. Larry contacted the bank and purchased the land from them. Of course, the thought of Larry committing this gruesome crime has crossed our minds. It seems out of the ordinary for Larry. He seems like a genuinely nice guy outside of work. 100 acres is enough for him to make a nice profit, but... Hardly enough to kill over, right? Other than the half acre the woman's house sat on, the rest was nothing but forest. 99 acres of timber for the crew to harvest and sell. Despite the rumblings of the crew and the town thinking Larry would do something so brutal, our crew eagerly began working and clearing the timber. For the first week, everything went as expected. When the team and I started to notice things we couldn't explain. Small things at first. All five of the gas canisters that held the fuel for the chainsaws were tipped over, causing the fuel to leak out into the ground. Plug wires removed from the spark plug, a cut pull cord on a chainsaw, several things that would halt work but not stop us from fixing the problem and continuing within minutes. Things quickly escalated. We returned from lunch and someone had drained the coolant from our knuckle boom loader. I had inspected the machine myself that morning and knew that there were no leaks, and it was full of coolant. That caused the loader to overheat and break down, effectively stalling our work for weeks until it was fixed. Once again, things escalated even more. My coworker Billy and I worked together for almost a decade cutting timber. We had become close friends. Our wives were friends as well, and we hung out quite often outside of work. Knowing him well makes what he did next out of the ordinary. On this day, everything seemed normal. One luxury we didn't have in the forest was a working restroom. Sometimes we must do what we must. Billy grabbed a roll of toilet paper from his truck and went out into the dense trees to do his business. Upon return, Billy appeared to be on edge. He looked pale white and only responded with, It's nothing. Everything is fine. When asked if he was okay, he then left for the day complaining of an upset stomach, only to call Larry later to inform him he was resigning from his job. This wasn't like Billy, 
He loved his career. It's all he knew. I tried calling only to get voicemail or send him a text and get no response. As strange as this was, we continued without him. After a hard morning of work, the crew went to a local restaurant for lunch, but I decided to save a little money that day and bring my own. I stayed at the job site to eat my bologna sandwich and a bag of Cheetos. I sat down on a stump and bit into my sandwich, regretting my decision to go with plain white bread instead of the sweet Hawaiian. The sound of a rock hitting the ground grabs my attention. I look up to see the rock bounce a few times and come to a rest at the base of the stump I sat on. What the hell? My thoughts were interrupted by a second rock being launched into my forehead. I looked around and I didn't see anyone. Real funny. Throwing rocks is kind of childish. I looked around, expecting to see one of the guys returning from their lunge. Another rock collides with my chest. This time I noticed what direction the stone came from. I stand up, peering in the direction I believe the rock had been thrown. I see some slight movement coming from behind a tree. I slowly walk up to the tree expecting to round it and see one of the jackass employees I work with screwing with me. Instead, I see the fiery eyes of Grace staring back at me. I stumble backward at the sight of the dead woman, my foot catching a tree root and sending me to the ground on my back. Grace loosened her tense jaw to speak. Get off my land. Don't touch another tree, or I'll haunt you for the rest of your life. Then, I'll be waiting for you in death. I pick myself up off the ground quickly and run back to my truck, hop in and peel out, never looking back. More guys left after I did, all having similar stories of their own, but Larry refused to pull the crew and equipment off the land. He paid for it, it was his now, and he would make his money from it. Two months after I quit, what was left of the crew showed up one morning to find Larry hanging from one of the trees that was set to be cut down. Cops were called, and, in many years, nobody knows if it was actually murder or a suicide. Officially, it was ruled as a suicide, though. If I was a betting man, I would put money on Grace having something to do with it from beyond the grave. One thing I was sure of, when Larry took his final breath, I know exactly who is there waiting for him. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange deep woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to punch that like button in its face so it knows you mean business. Be sure to subscribe if you're new, as it helps the swamp grow its ever-expanding waters. Don't forget to turn on that notification button so you don't miss a new episode as I upload them multiple times a week on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to potentially share your story in a future episode. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Deezer Radio, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It's absolutely free and always will be. Thank you guys so much for supporting the Swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you guys. I'd love to know in the comments what story was your favorite tonight, and if you made it all the way to the end, tonight's code word is 3905. Be sure to comment those numbers down below to confuse anybody else who didn't make it to the end. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top as always. Be sure to join me over on Facebook, Twitter, X, whatever it's called, Instagram, and all that good stuff. And I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.